Hi everyone. Welcome to lecture number one on the Reconstruction Era. This class begins at the end of one of the most tragic eras in our nation's history, the end of the Civil War. The human, physical, and economic costs of this conflict, a war that pitted Americans against Americans, was devastating. More than 615,000 Americans lost their lives. This was a far greater figure uh, by almost 200,000 than the number of killed in World War II. Besides the heavy human cost of the war, we also need to take a look at the physical and economic devastation wrought by years worth of unceasing conflict. Since the bulk of the fighting during the war took place on southern soil, the physical landscape of the South was decimated. The railroads, the ports, the trade and manufacturing centers had all been torn up or burned down by an invading Union army seeking to accelerate the end of this conflict. The physical devastation, the loss of port facilities, the loss of, of warehouses, railroad lines to transport goods from one place to another, also increased the economic effects of this war. You can see from the graph that I have here on the slide that the currency printed off by the Confederate States um, during the conflict will lose its value as a Union victory. Uh, approaches by 1865. For example, Confederate currency declined so much in purchasing power over time that eventually it took 60 to 70 dollars worth of Southern cash to equal the value of even, of even one U.S. gold-backed dollar. Basically, after the war, Southern money was worthless, and this will severely cripple economic reconstruction in the region for years. Further, once the war is over, all those torn up railroad lines don't mend themselves. Telegraph lines, uh, vital um, infrastructure that's needed for communication, those are not just rebuilt. There is no money to rebuild them. Warehouses don't magically regenerate at the end of the war. So all of this will hamper the ability of this entire region of the South to uh, regenerate, it, this is going to delay uh, the ability of people in that region to get goods to market, to send their goods to market for sale. Uh, it's it's going to be a nightmare, and we're not talking about it taking months or even years for bridges to get rebuilt or roads or railroad lines. We're talking decades in some cases. The agriculture of the South was also stressed by the war. Uh, farm output decreased significantly. Property was neglected due to the fact that a significant portion of the male workforce was now gone off to war. And then at the end of the conflict, you'll have some 4 million African American men and women, now known as freedmen, walking off of plantations seeking their liberty. This was certainly long overdue. The fact that these formerly enslaved men and women can now move about freely means that many of them are turning their backs on this long-standing symbol of racial oppression, the plantation. For southern farmers, though, uh, this represents a huge setback economically because their formerly oppressed labor force that they didn't bother to pay for all of their hard work is gone. So now they have crops that need to come in at the end of the year, and they're scrambling to do that. So for uh, again, from an economic perspective, the end of slavery uh, will also deal an economic blow to farmers in the region uh, for many years. Regardless, when we see the liberation, the long overdue freedom for former slaves, uh, this will represent a tremendous amount of social change in a very short period of time. Now former slaves, freed men and women, no longer have to tip their hat to every white person that they see and say, yes sir and yes ma'am. They now can move freely, and many of them will, to urban areas seeking paid employment and a better life. 
all of this social change, in fact, that we're going to see in the South is going to be a bitter pill for many white Southerners to swallow. And we're going to talk much more about the nasty backlash that we're going to see on the part of white Southerners against uh, this liberated class of freed men and women moving about freely. Beyond the physical, economic, and social turmoil generated in the South by the Civil War, we're also going to see a political storm brewing in our nation's capital at the end of the conflict. And at the center of this political storm will be no less than Commander-in-Chief Abraham Lincoln. We see, even before the end of hostilities, a rift developing within the, uh, the Republican Party. We have one faction of Republicans known as the Moderate Republicans, of which President Lincoln was one. Then we have another group of Republicans known as the Radical Republicans. They tended to dominate both houses of Congress. Why are there factions within the Republican Party? Well, a lot of it had to do with a set of priorities that each side was developing. For the Republican Party in general, they have the same set of priorities. It's just the order in which they want to approach them that they disagree on. For example, all Republicans want to win the war. They want to stitch the nation back together to find some way to bring the South back into the Union after they had seceded. And they want to address defending the rights of former slaves. The squabble that they have is over this to-do list, what should be number one on the to-do list? What should be number two? They differ in how they rank these goals. For President Lincoln, he's first and foremost wanting to, of course, wrap the war up, and then he wants to very quickly expedite the process of having the southern states rejoin the Union. Remember, when the Confederate states left the United States, they forfeited all of their representation in Congress because they are now an independent entity. They don't belong to the United States any longer. So at the end of the war, Lincoln wants to speed up the process of getting these southern states legally back into the Union and beginning this process of national healing. Next, a little further down his to-do list, was then addressing the issues of protecting the civil liberties of former slaves. Now I'm dramatically oversimplifying things, but we'll take those two points and, and run with them. For the radical Republicans that controlled the legislative branch, they control Congress, they favored an inversion of that priority list. They wanted um, a, a higher ranking priority to be attached to defending the rights of freed men and women. And then they wanted to tackle the issue of getting the southern states back into the Union. And they did not want to make this a speedy process. They wanted the southern states to um, learn from what they had done, learn from their mistakes. They did not want everything to just go back to normal. They wanted there to be a, a, a difficult process associated with them being readmitted to statehood in the Union so that hopefully they would never get the idea of secession in their head and we have a second civil war as a result. Now let's also take a moment to understand that there's a test of wills developing between two branches of the American government during Reconstruction. You're going to see a tug of war between the executive branch in the form of the presidency and the legislative branch in the form of the US Congress trying to negotiate who should take the lead in putting the country back together after the Civil War. In other words, the looming question was who's really in charge here? Well, why don't they just go to the Constitution of the United States and look up in the event of a civil war and the conclusion of a civil war and the country being put back together, uh, see Article 5, Section C about who should lead this process. Well, they can't do that because it's not there. It's not in the founding document for our nation. The Founding Fathers never envisioned a civil war, much less a period of having to piece together a broken country back into one. Now there's ample proof 
that regarding the issue of defending the rights of freed men and women, that Lincoln was ready to take up the cause of protecting their rights once the South had formally been readmitted to the Union. But we will never know the exact timeline for this because, tragically, President Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865, just as the war was coming to an end. The nation was shocked. The man who had guided the country through the worst episode in its history was now taken from them. And of course, for those radical Republicans in Congress, uh, they were not only grieving, but looking ahead saying, well, perhaps this is our opportunity to begin to take more of an active role in steering this process of reconstructing the nation. But if you thought the radical Republicans in Congress were frustrated with President Lincoln's, you know, slow timeline in defending the rights of freed men and women, they're going to be enraged by the next commander-in-chief, Andrew Johnson, who is openly hostile to the idea of protecting the rights of former slaves. Now President Andrew Johnson was a very different man than his predecessor in office. To begin with, Johnson was a Southerner by birth and had even owned slaves at one point in his life. He had no problem with the concept of holding another human being in bondage against their will and was once quoted as saying that he wished, quote, every head of family in the United States had one slave to take the drudgery or menial service off his family. For this reason and many more, uh, we're going to see that Johnson will immediately be at odds with the radical Republicans in Congress. And we're going to see a legislative uh, epic battle developed between Congress and Johnson uh, over who should lead Reconstruction. In particular, the radical Republicans of Congress will draft a number of pieces of legislation only to have President Johnson veto them or cancel them because he does not agree with their vision. This will lead to Johnson earning many high-ranking enemies in the U.S. Congress, and this behavior will ultimately lead to him being impeached by that body in 1868. More on that in just a few minutes. Now, turning back to events on the ground in the South at the end of the Civil War, immediately after the conflict ends, we will start to see domestic terrorist groups such as the KKK or the Ku Klux Klan coming into existence. These groups were populated by angry, disaffected Southern whites who will resort to violence and intimidation to assert their physical, economic, and social control over former slaves. In addition to reports of racial violence breaking out on the ground in the South, radical Republicans in Congress were also distressed to hear that Southern pol politicians were also trying to strip former slaves of their rights, that members of the KKK will visit the homes of um, black Southerners just attempting to vote and try to block them from doing so, using terrorism and violence. In the case of Abram Colby, as you can see from the account here on the slide, he will uh, be brutally beaten by members of the KKK just because he tried to vote for the Republican Party in their local elections. The Republican Party was the party of Lincoln at that time, the great emancipator. So for freed men during the Reconstruction era, of course, when an election rolls around, they're going to stick close to the party of Lincoln. For white Southerners, though, they hate the Republican Party. It represents their loss in the war. It represents a, a government that is foreign to them and one that wants to give social and economic and political rights to former slaves. In an overt bid to deprive former slaves of many of their rights, we will see southern states passing what become known as the Black Codes immediately following the end of the Civil War. A few of these laws were useful, such as legalizing marriage between blacks and granting former slaves the ability to sue in court. However, Overwhelmingly, these black codes being passed by Florida or Texas or Virginia or Georgia were meant to limit the freedom, the physical freedom, the social freedom, the economic uh, rights of many former slaves. We'll discuss more about the black codes in part two of this lecture.